I'm going to um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, present some a story from a, a research project that that I was involved in a while ago that focused on trying to understand a particular learning problem in the context of a particular learning design. But I'm going to kind of draw parallels between um, the methods used in that study, the analysis processes and the outcomes, and the way that we use learning analytics within our teaching. So essentially, um, collecting data on learner characteristics and their capabilities before and after some kind of teaching intervention um, or some kind of learning experience is not new. Based on that kind of data, we can, we can make various kinds of hypotheses about the relationship between the learner characteristics, the kind of interventions that we put in place and the outcomes, but they're only hypotheses. What learning analytics allows us to do is to actually gather data on the learning process. And it's the analysis of the learning process that allows us to find out um, at a much kind of deeper level what's actually going on in the student's learning. And, and that's how we can really test out whether, whether our hypotheses that we're coming up with have validity. And in this study, one of the interesting things is that what initially seemed as though um, there was a kind of a no significant difference result, so you can kind of throw away a particular learning innovation. By actually looking at data on the learning process, it became clear that the story was quite different and that there was actually different things going on with different groups of students learning <laughs> in particular ways. I guess the other key message that underpins what I'm talking about is, is an argument that there's only so far we can go in um, in learning analytics if we try and do so in a kind of learning design neutral way. So it's this kind of question of how much you can do at the institutional level and before you really need to actually start thinking at the individual subject or individual learning activity level to get really, really key benefits. And so the, the space that I'm operating here is in looking at learning analytics related to a particular learning design and the learning processes that occur in the context of that design. So the study that I'm, um, that I'm talking about is a study that draws on, I guess, what you would call learning sciences theories and, and methods. Um, so I'm looking at um, a study where I was trying to explore the difference between discovery learning and tutorial-based learning. Um, using multimedia learning resources. And I guess discovery learning is a kind of a learning design where the student explores some kind of learning resources in a reasonably free way and through that exploration process uncovers particular ideas, particular concepts, particular knowledge. Whereas a typical tutorial design is one where a student is taken kind of step by step through the material with a lot less control over their exploration. Now there's a lot of literature out there demonstrating that pure discovery learning doesn't work. That if you really want discovery learning to work, you need to add in a whole lot of extra support. You need some instruction at the beginning, you need scaffolding during the task, you need ideally cooperative learning strategies will really lead to success with discovery learning. So we know that, but in this particular study, we are really interested in trying to kind of look at the specific differences between a discovery and a tutorial design. So we kind of really narrowed the learning design down to the kind of essence of the difference. We provided some instruction at the beginning, but during the task we left them free to discover if they were in the discovery group and gave them step-by-step -step, um, information if they were in the tutorial group. So the theoretical underpinnings of the research um, are based on kind of ideas of constructivist, constructivist theories of learning that date back to Piaget. So the idea that through a discovery learning approach, the learner is able to form their own hypotheses about the particular knowledge domain. They, can, they construct their own knowledge representation. They then scrutinise that through exploring a resource and they're constantly reconstructing their knowledge representation based on the feedback they're getting through that exploration of the resource. So the constructivist theories of learning 
would predict that a discovery learning design is going to be more successful in terms of really developing an understanding because of that process of construction and reconstruction of the personal knowledge representation. So the experimental design here, we focused on two content domains um, within the sciences. So one focused on understanding concepts around global warming and particular factors that contribute to global warming. And in the other, we fo focused on concepts around blood alcohol concentration and particular things that lead to blood alcohol concentration and how it changes over time, depending on particular things that you might do, drinking alcohol, for example, but also other things. Um, the way that we, we, broke, we, we did the design, we had two different learning designs within each of those content domains. So we had four different resources, a discovery and a tutorial resource focused on blood alcohol concentration and a discovery and tutorial resource focused on global warming. And each participant completed a pretest on knowledge within each content domain, tasks using a tutorial resource in one content domain and the discovery resource in the other content domain, and then did a post test on each content domain. And we randomised the order. So essentially, um, that enables us to compare <coughs> the performance in the blood alcohol concentration between the tutorial and discovery participants and separately analyse and compare the performance of the tutorial and discovery participants in the global warming design. I'll just pause there because if you don't kind of understand the design, then the rest of it might not make sense either. So is there any questions about the way we've kind of structured that study? Is it okay on a balance bit with the question on the um, <coughs> So these 73 students are the same 73 students here, yeah, because each student is doing two, um, yeah. So, but essentially you can treat them as two separate um, studies for the purpose of analysis. Same sequence type? Uh, Randomise the sequence. So half of the students did the tutorial um, first and half did the discovery first in, <coughs> each, in each of the, yeah, I see what you mean. yeah, yeah, yeah. So the resources essentially each consisted of some initial screens providing just a bit of some background information to the content domain. So explaining, for example, in global warming, what some of the key um, terminologies that they would encounter would be, um, and similarly with blood alcohol concentration, but, but not explaining the relationship between what we might call the, the income variables and, and the output variables. Um, they had to discover those themselves through their interaction with a simulation if they're in the discovery group or discover them themselves through step-by-step -step, um, presentation of information if they're in the tutorial group. So let's just have a look at the, um, the way the interface looked. So this is the, um, the main discovery interface for the blood alcohol concentration resource. Um, so prior to seeing this screen, they'd seen um, half a dozen somewhere between six and 12 screens um, of information, just providing them some background. Then they, go, they see the first of these screens and what they are asked to do on this screen is to, um, is to manipulate um, various parameters. So the weight of a person, the time they started drinking, the time they stopped drinking, whether or not they had a meal, number of standard drinks, the time they went to sleep and the time they woke up. And then when they've manipulated those variables, they then run the simulation and they'll see, what they'll see is in the, the red line, the output from running that simulation with the parameters that they've entered. And the blue line shows a set of pre-provided parameters just so that they've got a comparison point. And obviously one of the strategies a student might use is to begin with the parameters the same as the blue line and vary one um, variable at a time in order to kind of see what the impact of changing particular variables is on the, on the outcome. <coughs> the tutorial version has the same visual interface, but in the tutorial version, the parameters are set for the student. And so the main difference is that in the tutorial version, they're taken through a series of screens where one variable is changed at a time, and so they they still have to kind of glean the, um, the relationship from the output, but they don't do that process of forming a hypothesis and, 
and testing out the hypothesis by actually manipulating the variables themselves. The global warming um, resource has a similar kind of structure in the sense that on the left hand side there are variables that they can modify. Um, CO2 emissions, CO2 emissions absorbed by plants and CFC emissions. And on the right hand side there are various graphs that show the impact of those variable changes on particular um, environmental factors. This one's a little bit harder to, um, to understand and in retrospect more challenging for the student because of the different representations they have to kind of get their head around. Similar idea though where the tutorial group <coughs> see a series of screens. So the data collection consisted of multiple choice tests on the key concepts undertaken beforehand and after exploration. We also did questionnaires on cognitive load and engagement and we also logged the students' um, actions in the resource and I'll talk about that in a minute. So the results um, were interesting. So what we found was there was tended to be little or no improvement on the post-test. Um, a very small effect of learning condition on blood alcohol, um, on the blood alcohol resource with students using the um, discovery resource performing marginally better um, than students in the tutorial resource. They just on, just because of statistical fluctuations, they were slightly better on the pre-test, but the difference between their pre and post um, was measurable, whereas they had they appeared to not learn anything. They didn't, it looks like they've gone backwards, but there was really no significant difference between pre and post um, for the tutorial group there. So it looked as though the discovery students did better on the blood alcohol concentration, but on the global warming, um, the discovery students um, didn't um, do any better than the tutorial. Um, and there was very little learning on either group. So some surprises there for us, we, because as I said, the theory suggested that in both of the um, different resources, the students would um, perform you know, significantly better through the discovery paradigm than through the tutorial paradigm. So we looked at this very hard. We looked at the resources, we looked at um, the tests, we tried to see whether there were flaws in the test instrument. We'd done pilot tests with the resources and we were convinced that students were able to learn. We did interviews with students and learning seemed to be occurring. So we were a bit bemused by some of this. Um, what we looked at when we started looking at the log files, we noticed that students in the discovery, when they were going through the discovery resources, some of the students explored in a, seemed to be exploring systematically, while some students seem to be changing three or four variables at a time. And clearly that would be likely to lead to confusion. So we thought about different ways in which we might characterise their exploration strategy to see whether there was a difference in performance of the discovery participants depending on their exploration strategy. We had a number of different variables that we could consider using in doing that. Time they spend on the task as a whole, time spent on particular screens, number of iterations through the simulation, the number of variables they changed during each iteration, the actual values they were choosing are all different things that we could um, crunch as numbers, as analytic data to kind of characterise students' actual strategies to see whether there's something different going on depending on the strategy. In the end, what we decided to go with was uh, more of a kind of a, a, of a characterisation based on our kind of big picture thinking as to what we thought would be a successful strategy. In our view, changing one variable at a time would be the most successful strategy. We did actually advise students to change one variable at a time, um, but quite a few students didn't take that advice. So we broke the students in the two different discovery um, conditions into two groups a group who we characterised as systematic discovery. So students who for four or more cycles through the simulation changed only one variable from the previous cycle or changed um, 
made, set up the parameters so that there was only one variable different from the provided blue values. So either of those strategies would give them a comparison point that would allow them to glean something from the effect of changing one variable. And then we classified the students who did, who changed one variable at a time less than four times as non-systematic participants. So when we, um, when we looked at the results, breaking that down, so now we had three groups in each case. We had the tutorial group, the non-systematic discovery group and the systematic discovery group in each case. In each case, when we crunched those numbers, we found that the systematic discovery group performed significantly better than the non-systematic discovery group and there was no significant difference between the non-systematic discovery and the tutorial group in each of the two content domains. So it's an interesting little study just in terms of showing how just kind of looking at the different learning interventions and the learning outcomes can lead you to a kind of misleading conclusion about the um, various efficacy of a particular learning design. Whereas when you actually look at the learning process, you can actually find out what's going on. And quite often, students are not actually behaving in a way that you intend them to behave within your particular learning design. So, you know, this is obviously a case where we've got a, you know, a, a purpose-built simulation. But you can imagine a learning design where you're expecting your students to, um, you know, read some chapters out of a textbook, um, perhaps post some reflective comments to their blog, perhaps comment on someone else's blog, answer some questions as part of a small group discussion on a discussion forum, carry out some kind of end of topic quiz. You know, you might have a learning design where there's a range of different things you're expecting students to do. Knowing whether they actually do those things and whether they do them in the kind of sequence that you expect um, helps you to see whether the problem, if they don't actually learn as effectively as you'd hoped, is caused by the learning design or the student's behaviour in actually carrying out their own learning within the context of the design that you've articulated. So I think there's a lot, you know, so there's a lot of parallels between this kind of study and the work that we need to do in terms of thinking about the way that we use analytics in analysing um, student learning in our subjects. Now, an interesting question here that has kind of come up in some of the different presentations is when you're in a space with a situation like this where you've got a whole heap of data about the student learning process, how do you actually crunch that data in order to characterise the student learning? One way, which is the approach we took here, is to use your hypotheses about what an effective learning strategy is and actually narrow in on the parts of the data that, that you think are relevant in that. The other way of doing it is to gather all the data you can and then kind of just crunch the data in an empirical way without any kind of theory. And, and obviously techniques like cluster analysis are commonly used for that kind of thing. And we did actually do some cluster analysis on this data and the cluster analysis um, identified, I think, three clusters rather than the two where um, time spent on the simulation and the number of variables they changed the iteration kind of became the two key variables that characterised the students in the different clusters. But in the end, we felt as though in terms of communicating, because we're you know, doing this in order to publish in a, in a journal, communicating to a journal reader, the kind of characterisation of the groups was clearer if we did it in a way that was based on our, our theoretical assumptions about effective learning within this kind of resource. But it's just an interesting problem. And Krishna talked about in his study having kind of learning scientists as well as kind of number crunchers there so that you kind of impose some sensibility on your number crunching. And so sometimes it's a combination of those things where you're, you know, you're doing your, your automated techniques um, as well as your um, kind of theory-driven techniques um, as you're doing that kind of characterisation of students. Some of the other techniques... Um, that my colleague on the study, Gregor Kennedy, has done in some of his other work, has used things like hidden Markov models, which is a more kind of complex um, data processing thing where you've got a, re a really large number of variables. I couldn't tell you much more about that, except that that's an alternative approach in some situations. Um, 
and then others have used kind of various kinds of rule-based um, or heuristic sort of strategies to characterise students based on a number of different variables. Um, so there's definitely a decision to make in that situation. So, in, so just some interesting kind of take-homes from, from the study. So what would you do, let's say this was your particular subject area, what would you do as a result of, of this kind of data? Well, the first thing that you would probably do is to say, well, let's provide better information to the students to encourage them to use a strategy that's likely to be successful. So really emphasise changing one variable at a time might be one of the things you might do. You could actually program the resource so that it's only possible to change one variable at a time, or you could put into the resource some kind of um, dynamic um, <coughs> feedback that actually every now and then pops up if a student is consistently changing more than one variable at a time and pops up and says, look, you're likely to be confused with this strategy. It's really suggested here that you change one variable at a time. And you can kind of think of parallels between that and what we might do if we've got students learning within a learning management system where the learning design is expecting them to you know, read some stuff on various screens, go off and look at some YouTube videos, post some stuff to their blog, respond to the discussion forum. It could actually monitor the learner activity and provide reminders to the student if they're kind of bypassing particular things, if they're just reading the screens but they're never actually going and doing any of the actual peer learning work or, or you know, actually posting reflective comments to their blog, then it could pop up and kind of remind them that it's been found in the past that these are really important parts of the, of the learning strategy. I guess um, where, we could, where you might take some of this in terms of thinking about... Um, what kinds of resources we need to provide to academic staff who want to make use of um, learning design specific learning analytics within their subjects. Well firstly we need to really encourage people to develop a more sophisticated understanding of the relationship between learning activities and outcomes within their particular subject. So gathering learning analytics that can be analysed at the end of a semester so that it's really easy for an academic to look at the behaviours of their different students and what kinds of behaviours led to success is a really good first step because obviously then we can refine our learning design. If it turned out that um, students that posted a lot of stuff to their blog actually did worse because they wasted a lot of time doing that and it actually would have been better for them to spend more time doing the quizzes then you know, we can refine the design and get rid of the blog activity. So you can kind of, if we can get analytics that at least allow us to look at the relationship between student learning behaviours and learning outcomes, we can refine the design. So that's a, you know, a really good first step. Um, if we're going to get more sophisticated with that, maybe we need to be able to provide academic staff with not just access to the data, but some of these more complex kinds of analysis tools that will actually do perhaps cluster analysis on data to characterise students, rather than expecting them to kind of look at each particular data source separately. Just being able to check whether, um, you know, using the forum or not led to a difference between learning outcome, using the blog or not, um, reading the materials or not, that's a fairly blunt instrument. But if you can actually crunch all of that together and you can see that there's a couple of different characterisations of students. There's the individual learner who, you, who read all of the materials thousands of times but did no peer engagement. There's another learner who's really high on peer engagement um, but doesn't engage much with the content. And there's another student who spends no time at all in the resource at all and just tries to do the assessment task. And you can compare those different students. That might give you a more sophisticated understanding. But obviously, we need better tools to be able to do that kind of thing. So we need tools that make it easier for us to develop both empirically and also theoretically informed characterisations of successful and unsuccessful strategies that are specific to particular learning contexts. And I can kind of visualise a situation where, you know, the data's all there, the dashboards are there, but they're tailorable. So that you can kind of form your own hypotheses about 
which particular kinds of learning behaviours are important and look at dashboards that are tailored to your particular learning situation rather than kind of a blunt instrument that comes up with a red signal because the student hasn't used the discussion forum when the discussion forum isn't actually part of your learning design at all. Um, and then eventually, it'd be great if we could then not just refine our learning designs, but actually introduce some kinds of adaptive materials or tailored support that actually provides feedback to the students based on um, this kind of learning design specific analysis.